Um, our plan tonight is I'm going to kind of finish up chapter number 10. We just have one more example to go through. And then we're going to pass it on to Connor to talk about chapter 11, bookmarking. And then um, we'll end it from there. And so uh, I guess we'll just kind of just dive right in here. So let me share my screen. Oh, where's my book? There it is. Connor, it's nice to see you again. It seems we have passed in the night over the last few calls. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had some conflicts a couple of weeks in a row. Yeah. And then yeah, it's like you had this, you had, you had conflicts on the other days. Yeah, yeah, but here we are. And also, Brian, nice to meet you. I don't know if we've met before. It's nice to see you. Hi, nice to meet everyone. So, let's see here. Can everybody see my slides? Okay, cool. So, uh, the last example in Chapter 10 was talking about dynamic filtering. And so, if you're, um, unfortunately, I haven't got the video up from last week. I've just been kind of slammed myself with work and other presentations that I've had to give. So, I'll, uh, I'll get that up for people that weren't able to attend last week. But if you were able to join, dynamic filtering is very similar to the last example where we were creating multiple controls and we were using uh, functional programming to create many different components to our UI. But now with the dynamic filtering example, the thing is, is that we're taking data as an input and with this data, we're using that data to, to determine how many um, UI elements get added to it. And so that's going to be based on the number of variables that are added to the data or, or the number of variables within the data. And so the first thing that I kind of wanted to, to kind of highlight about this is I think this was kind of missing from the chapter, but it, it was... It wasn't explicitly implied, but it was kind of implied within the chapter was kind of like this idea that when you're kind of doing these things, you should really kind of start with solving a very small problem, scale it up, and then start to generalize it. And so I think the book tried to kind of show that with the step-by-step -step process, but really when you're kind of thinking about using like functional programming, it's really good to kind of start small, solve that small problem, scale it up to start taking on bigger problems, and then see if you can even generalize it even more so it can be applied in different areas. And so that was kind of an important concept that uh, I don't think the book was explicit about it, but it was kind of implicitly there. So this example, looking at this, and we'll look at it all in, all in its entirety um, in the code with the example that I have. But really, it first starts off by creating two different functions. And the first function that it creates is that make UI function. And really all this make UI function is doing is it's just a conditional statement that is taking the data sets, taking in the data set and the data set variable. And what it's doing is it's determining if it's a numeric variable or if it's a factor variable or if it's anything else. If that variable that gets inputted is a numeric variable, it's gonna give it that slider input because it's a numeric variable. If it's a factor variable, it's going to evaluate it being as factor, and then it's going to create this select input. And so all this make UI function does is it's just a conditional to say, okay, here's one variable in the data set from the input that, or here's from the inputted data, or here's the variable from the inputted data that you had. And is it numeric? Is it factor? Or is it something else? And if it's numeric, it's going to be this. If it's factor, it's going to be this. If it's something that's not available or it's something, some different data structure, it's just going to be not supported in null. The other function that gets defined out of this as well is this filter var. And all this does is kind of does the same kind of thing, but it's just for filtering out the specific data. So based on what type of data it is. So it takes in the data object, it takes in the specific variable, the value, and then it assesses if it's numeric or if it's factor. And it pretty much filters based on that. So if it's numeric, it's going to pass that uh, data object through this kind of filter statement. And if it's new, if it's uh, a factor, then it's going to run it through this filter statement. And if it evaluates to, or if it gets down to this end part of this conditional flow, it's just not going to do anything. So that was kind of the first thing. But now that we have these functions defined outside of both of our UI and our server, 
we kind of get to this next thing about um, trying to um, trying to avoid repetition by applying these functions. And so the book first applies kind of this dynamic filtering with this one data set. So solving for one problem, this specifically being uh, giving those inputs based on the iris data set. And then the first thing that you're going to notice is, is that when we solve for this one specific data set, you start to see some of this repetition within the UI and the server. And so if you look very closely here in the UI, you can see you have three repetitions here, make UI, make UI, make UI. And each one of these um, represents a specific column within the, within the IRIS data set. So if you look at the IRIS data set, you have sepal length as a variable, you have sepal width as a variable, you have species as a variable, and this is repetition. And if we go back to the principles of functional programming, it basically says this, that if you copy and paste more than twice, you should write a function and try and map that function to make your code more succinct. Same thing with this filter variable as well. With this reactive, we're gonna, we're gonna use filter var three times here. We repeated ourselves more than twice. So we should apply some type of functional programming uh, to kind of take care of some of this repetition. And so that's where this next stage kind of comes in here. This is where those map functions are applied. Again, map functions basically allow us to take a function and iterate that function over some list of objects, okay? So in our case, um, once we kind of get to the stage here, what it's doing is it's taking the names of Iris and then it's applying this make UI function or iterating that function over all of those names for those variables in Iris. So there's three variables. So this will get run three times. Same thing with when we pass, uh, once we pass the actual Iris data set into our reactive function here, same thing. It's going to filter those data set. It's going to filter that data set uh, three times because we have three specific variables, or it's going to apply this filter bar three times. This reduce, I'm not a hundred percent sure on what this does, but um, if anybody has any insight in what this reduce does, I think I have an idea of what it does, but um, I'm just going to open it up to the group. Does anybody have any idea of why this reduce was included? I didn't know if anybody had one. Um, I know reduce, when I looked up the, the, um, the documentation, it's basically applying one function across. It's a, it's a map function. It's part of per but it's basically taking this object of each variable and it's applying this function to all of them, I think. And so I can't remember why it was doing this or why it was there, but I think I have another idea for it. I think it's part of the filtering, but. Um, it it combines, so, so reduce combines multiple things into one in general. So mm -hmm. I don't know what exactly it's doing, but we can assume that it's, taking multiple things and returning one value. Mm. Okay. Because then again, this reactive gets passed into, this is, see, this is what got kind of confusing because it looks like we're doing subsetting here and it looks like it's taking this selected. I'll show you what I think it's doing. I think it's creating like a true false vector and then it's reducing it all down into true, like what, how many values are true. And then it actually does the filtering in this filtering are they're doing filtering based on subsetting by passing that vector into here and then subsetting it um, through iris. That's what I got <laughs> for this because um, this one got pretty crazy. So once we get to that, but so then the next step up from this, I'll show you the example that I have and I think we can kind of pick it apart because I did some print debugging to see if I could figure out what was going on. But with, <clears throat> but with the next step, so we solved for one problem. We took care, or we took care of some of that repetition by applying some of those functional programming concepts. And then now we're going to try and generalize it. And so, how this app specifically generalizes it is it's allowing uh, flexibility for the user to select what type of data set they want to use. And so, they select what type of data that they want through some type of um, select input. And then, based on what data set the user selects, 
it's going to go through specific functions to get that data set, determine what types of variables they are to save it as a reactive. And then it's going to follow that kind of same structure where it renders the UI based on how many uh, variables are in the data set. And then it's going to filter those variables as well and then output a specific uh, table within your UI. So again, there's a lot of moving parts to these examples. So, and I am moving kind of fast. So if people do have questions, just, you know, please let me know. Okay. So let's just kind of jump into this example here. And I know, like I said, this is going to be a lot and I'm going to do what I did last week. I, I tried to kind of take some of these functions and put in like print statements and other messaging statements so that we can kind of dissect what is going on here. And so I'm just going to quick kind of give a brief overview of what this looks like. This first function here is just the make UI function. But all I really do here is I add, I'm using a package called use this, which just puts a message in our console. It just helps me kind of separate out in the console to say like, this is a UI element, this is a UI element, this is a UI element. Uh, and then the other thing is, is I created this message so that when this X argument is passed into the function, it's printing out and telling us what type of uh, variable or what type of data object is getting passed into X. All this is the same that we talked about before. And then I'm gonna print out that input that was outputted so we can kind of see what's going on. And to make sure that the application still works, I'm going to explicitly return that input outputted. Uh, same thing here. I'm going to keep the browser out for now, but I'm just going to print out what bar looks like. So we can kind of see that get printed to the console. And then pretty much here is just the entire application, which we were talking about before. So let's just run this and see what happens here. So, uh, oh yeah, the other thing that I did is to kind of simplify this a little bit. I set this um, this select input here to be specifically for the cars data set because it only does have two variables and it's going to make the output, you know, not just this like 12 different variable output in it. So if we kind of just pick apart, once this application rendered, we can see on the background or we can see what's kind of running in the background. You can see that we have this input created and that input was the specifically this first variable, which is speed. And then we can see that because this input was created from that data set that we've selected, it outputs this first UI element, which is this speed range selector right here. Then the same thing happens again because we're iterating it because we have two objects in that, in that list element. We get a second one. We can see that this data is also, or this vector is numeric as well. And then it creates this, you know, it creates the HTML for that specific input for the user to select right here. And then it goes through and it first initially starts as null and they're logical nulls. But then once the UI gets rendered, then the UI um, sets these, uh, sets the range. So based on the range of the actual variable itself. So four and 25 for speed and distance two and 120. So if I pull back in the application again, you can see how that sets the range. And that's based on, um, I think it's based on the min and max of speed and distance. Then, it, then we get a lot of true and false. And that's where I think this is where the, oh, what was it? This is where we had that conversation with reduce because what I think it's doing is it's creating, based on what the filter inputs are, it's creating like a true false vector. And then it reduces it all down into one vector of true, true, true. And that is what actually does the filtering, I think. If somebody wants to either confirm or deny my understanding of it, but I was kind of thrown off when I did some of this print debugging and I saw these, like all this true, 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 false, 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 and then it all being reduced down into all of this true. And so I was kind of thrown off of it for a little bit. But uh, the other thing too, is you can kind of play around with this and it should um, change in the background. So you can see um, just kind of changing this, you can see the inputs were actually changed. 
these filtering, again, if my assumption is true or if I'm thinking of this correctly, it changes these vectors that are used to filter the actual data set itself. And so if you want to select another data set, let's, let's do CO2. It's going to change here in the background again. Here's all the UI elements that created that are iterated. Here is the, um, the vectors for all the data, for all the different objects within the data set. So you can obviously see one was a character vector, character, character, and then numeric, numeric, and then um, the filtering vectors with the true and false. Again, this is, I don't know if this is 100% correct, but that's just the way I understand it. So any questions? <laughs> I know that was a lot. And, but uh, if anybody has any other input or have any questions or want to pick up, pick this apart even more, um, just let me know. Okay, excellent. So the last couple parts of this, let me see, go back to our quick notes here. So just some basic conclusions about this. It's, um, so really, it kind of comes down to that you have this flexibility to do this. The book also talks about dialog boxes, but it uh, it kind of just says that we don't have enough tools for it or it doesn't provide enough examples, so I didn't dig into it. And then the last thing that the book kind of talks about is that although this is very powerful and it gives a lot of flexibility to your user, if you rely on it too much, it's going to make your UI too laggy. And so it's something to take into consideration. Yes, it's nice to provide our user with this flexibility, but with great power comes great responsibility. And so with that power, you know, it could be just too, it just might be too much for your application to handle. The other thing is, is you want to take into consideration user experience. Uh, are you really going to need it? So Yagni, if, if you're not going to need it, just take it out. Um, yeah, it might be cool that you provide this flexibility, but are you willing to have this flexibility at the cost of user experience? So that's all I got for chapter 10 to finish it up. Any questions? Anyone want to dig deeper? So I was reading on 10.3 10 on that section about reduce. So she says he, he uses reduce to take that vector and combine it into a single logical vector. And then, so I think he's he's taking that that combined vector and then in that final call to output where he assigns the table to, mm -hmm. to, over to data, he's using that vector of trues and falses to filter the iris. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And, and that, that kind of threw me off too, because I thought that's what filter var did. I was like sitting there, I was like, well, why wouldn't filter var do that? Like this function, this kind of defined function that he had, then I was sitting there, I was like, well, that's not necessarily what it's doing because it looks like it's using subsetting to filter. And so that's what kind of threw me off a little bit. But it, it looks like that's what's happening, right? Because we're getting a bunch of true falses here. And then it looks like it gets reduced down into one single vector of true and false. So that's the way I'm understanding how that works. So I think filter var just, it filters based on the class, right? Uh, Checks if it's numeric. If not, then tries factor. Okay. Oh, so okay. then he's, he's mapping that over the, uh, um, where is he here? Taking his variables and then using that to, to dynamically do it. So he, so he doesn't need to, need to know what, what class it is before he applies the, the function. Mm -hmm. Mm, that makes sense. But yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah, it's cool. So, but, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Um, 
and it, but it's it take you have to hold a lot of, up here <laughs> to know what's going on. So, but I mean, it was kind of nice that we could rely on print debugging here to kind of see what what's happening. So, you know, if you're having any issues and you're trying to deploy something like this, you know, use print debugging, print it out to the console and get an idea of what's happening. Cause I wouldn't have been able to understand this if I didn't do the, do the, the print debugging and actually kind of dig into it. I mean, you could even go further and start dumping browsers into here, like browser functions and really kind of playing around with it and seeing it like in its current state. But just for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. Cool. Any other questions, comments? All right, cool. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you, Connor. Um, so I'll stop sharing. And then I will mute myself and... I'll let you have the floor. All right, let me share my screen here. Um, yeah. All right, is this is this uh, showing up for everybody? Not quite yet. Try the. Okay. Uh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, and now I lost my, okay, all right. Um, so, so yeah, I was kind of impressed by this chapter. It's pretty brief, but, you know, I've already thought, thought of multiple ways I could use this functionality in my own apps. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. It's, you know, straightforward. Um, so let me get into it real quick here. Um, so basically, this is if you want to share the state of your app with someone else. So if you have 40 inputs in your app and you want to share and you want to share some output with a friend, you can't just tell them, oh, here's this app, and then put these 40 things in there. That's not going to fly. So if you can if you can if you can capture the state of the app at that point in time with those inputs with bookmarking, then you can just share the URL, or you can do it server side as well. Um, so I, this is a pretty cool, pretty cool function, I thought. Um, so I'll, let me run this this app here real quick. Um, so we have our UI. Let me comment this out real quick and get rid of that, and then we'll just run that. All right, so this is just a fun app. You can draw some shapes with. It's pretty cool. Um, but say you wanted to share this with a friend, you'd have to write these values down, right? And that's not not very very uh, straightforward. Um, so what they do is they use this bookmark button function, which is really just an action button. Um, there's it here. It's really just an action button with some preset values. Um, so you, so if you want to change the look of it with an icon or the label, you can change all that. Um, but, and then in the shiny app call at the bottom, you uh, do enable bookmarking equals URL and that defines how it, it'll handle the, the output of this. And then if you run that again with those updates, you know, as soon as you hit, hit bookmark here, it creates this string, which is a URL. So this is localhost, right? The port number, and then these are all the inputs. So anything in that input list from Shiny gets fed into here. Um, so this is, you know, took about three seconds to do, and you don't have to feed all the inputs. It captures all the inputs from, um, from these values here in the UI. So, you know, it does all the work for you. It's pretty cool. Connor, I think that's called an API call, isn't it? The question mark and then passing the variables of each service. Yes. Yep. So I was going to make that. No, exactly. Okay. So, so I've been trying to learn Plumber 
or a plum R. Um, and this is exa exactly how it works there. Um, so, and we can, we can move on to the next section here. Um, there's another way where instead of creating that string in that pop-up menu, it will automatically change the URL in the URL bar. Um, so I think this is some of the stuff I covered. Um, so yeah, we're gonna add some, some arguments and functions to our server call. Um, so this, this gathers all the values in your input and then it does the bookmark. And then every time that, that changes, it'll update the URL. So, and this is what that, so you put that at the bottom of your, of your uh, um, server and you gotta have session in here as an argument in server um, because the bookmark is session oriented. And oh, I, and I skipped one pretty important thing early, early on. The, you've got to turn your UI into a function, right? So, and this bookmark adds an argument to the UI function. So it's no longer just UI and then like, as you normally would, you, you turn the UI into a function with, with this you know, re request object. And then you have your function as you normally would, but you add this button um, element in there. Um, and that captures all your inputs. Um, so, so, so like it's, it, I showed here, like this is the, this is the protocol, this is the domain name, and then this is the app name, and then here's all your inputs, and it shows up like an API would, right, with the ampersand and, uh, and everything else. Uh, the question mark. Um, so yeah, it really turns your app into an endpoint, like an API. Um, so let's do an example of that. So, so here we're gonna change up this. So now the app will automatically update the URL every time an input changes. Um, point two, here we are. So here I've got the, the bookmark button as usual in the UI. Um, is there and then server and you're, you're adding these things there, right? And then we have this enable bookmarking thing. Wait a minute, I think I skipped one, sorry. Uh, enable bookmarking, here we go. Um, so let me run this. So if you open up in the browser, um, every time you change this, the delta will change in the URL. And same with Omega, Omega is 0.35, now it's, now it's that, now it's two. Right, so it changes in the app, but also changes in the URL. And then you can just copy and paste that. You can also hit this from an API perspective you could say damping equals 0 0.5. Um, oh no, sorry, it's 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 uh it's bounded there. So 0 0.8, sorry, 0 0.95. I keep doing things outside the bounds. Um, geez. There we go, 95. And omega, you know, you could change that up here to negative two. So it changes so, in the app and it changes here. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Connor. Um, but I was just kind of thinking, is that why we have to make our UI a function now? Because it has that argument request as the function. And so does that mean that when we change the URL input, like the parameters in the URL, that's getting set to this object called request in our environment, then which gets passed to the UI? Is that, is that why? That's my understanding. Yeah, that that's the, the way it makes sense to me. Hmm. Um, and you know that makes it a lot more flexible and user friendly. Um, it does mean that it ex exposes your app to a whole bunch of um, values outside the range. 
of one of the specs. So, you know, if I do omega as minus five, you know, that's outside the range. So it reverts back to minus two. And if I do omega is 10, it goes to two, which is the max. Because there's no, there's no validate code in the server. Connor, correct me if I'm wrong, but this isn't overly helpful if you're running your own internal server. It's more appropriate for uh, uh, shiny, uh, shiny IO uh, or if you're hosting your own web server and, and, and you're interacting with, with more of an API call concept, right? Doing it locally to your own machine doesn't really do much in a collaboration setting. Am I stating that correctly? It's got to be. Yeah, a, that's correct. This is only for sharing. Central location. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, and that, I, you know, as soon as it's on API, I thought, you know, what happens if you throw some really, really unexpected stuff at it? So, what, what if you do try a string when it's expecting a numeric in Omega, right? So it reverts to, to minus two. So, if you're going to expose this sort of thing to the internet, then you might want to add some validation code to make sure that nothing really, really unexpected happens. Yeah, and I think that's the inherent read-only slash executable with a web server, at least on a, on a Unix-derived web server, you want to be able to protect or, or symlink to the executable code so that it does prevent any of that potential tampering, right? Right. Well, I, I was just saying you could do the validate in uh, in your server object here. You know, with uh, shiny validate, and then if, if the if the input from the API is not does not meet this condition, then you can safely handle that error. Um, so let me go back to the, so does that make sense to everybody? I kind of went fast there. Okay. Um, All right, so this is all, so far we've all handled the state in the URL, right? Either we're creating a pop-up that has the string or we are using this server code to change the, the URL as our inputs change. Um, the other way to do that is store the state server side. Um, so obviously that, involves having storage on your server and you've got to manage that yourself. Um, but if you have many more inputs, say if you had hundred inputs, then having a URL that stores those 100 inputs is just not you know, feasible. So this can be a better, a better way to do that. Um, so it basically hashes the, uh, the inputs and saves it locally in, in the server directory, and then uses this to look up in that directory. Uh, so let me run that and we'll see what that looks like. So again, we have our UI bookmark button. We have this code. And then we have, instead of URL here, it's gonna be server side. So it captures the state server side. And spoiling the surprise here, as we run this, the server is, you know, it's just my directory here, right? So if I bookmark this code, all of a sudden here, it's gonna make a new directory here that's, that stores that, and they're stored in, in, in here. And these are RDS files, right? So if we wanted to 
inspect that. Um, actually, that, that, that's in one of the examples, so I'll wait to show that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the chapter. It's, it's, you can either store the state in a string as the URL, or you can store the state of the app server-side in an RDS file. Um, and you can choose your level of complexity depending on your, your use case. Are there any questions? So um, I guess with the RDS file, you know, I'm, I'm wondering why it saves it as, I know RDS is like a lightweight kind of data structure. <clears throat> and I was just kind of wondering like why it wouldn't just save it as like, I don't know. And maybe, maybe I'm thinking outside the bounds here, like just like a JSON file or like a string or a text file with all the parameters in it. You know, I, I was kind of interesting when you opened that up because I was wondering <clears throat> what gets stored and it's that RDS file. And so if that's just special to R, or if it's like there's a specific reason for saving that as an RDS file. Yeah, so, so RDS is a serialized data format. Um, so actually, let's try and <clears throat> if we have this available... We can open this up. Our data file open with, um, do I have Adam or something? Oh, okay. Adam. So, you know, it's not like a flat file, like a CSV or JSON. Like this contains like the entire state of the app. And Adam doesn't know how to read it because it's not meant to be read that way. Mm -hmm. um, so JSON, you could you could save the, the the literal values of your inputs in a flat file like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then it would have to recompile that app as well. Whereas I think the RDS file gives it all combined. Mm. That makes sense. Um, the only other time I've used RDS files is, is uh, saving models. You know, if, if you fit a model, then you can write that to an RDS file. Um, so you don't have to refit it again. Hmm. Um, so that's, you know, if you need to save, but if you need to save binary um, objects from, from your R session, um, then that's how you do that. Um, so they, they have some exercises here for us. Um, they've got some challenges here. Um, if, if, if you're using a random number generator, then you need to be able to set a seed and make that reproducible. Um, I don't do that much, so I didn't look into that. But you know, that's a a case where you need to be more careful because the state is no longer um, deterministic, right? It depends on that seed. Um, if you have tab set panels, you need to supply the ID in there so we can regenerate that. Um, you can exclude things, exclude inputs. So if you don't want those to show up in the URL or to be stored on the server, you can add them in this function here and then it'll hide those. Um, and you can, you know, you can do a lot more advanced stuff. Um, that was a little bit beyond me. Um, but I'll get into these exercises here. Um, so he wants us to, to make a, an app that visualizes the noise from this package. Um, you can control the frequency in these other variables. Um, I didn't quite get to this part, so maybe we can, we can walk through that. Um, let me open this up. So if we open up ambient and the function is noise simplex. So this generates the noise. 
And oh, here, here's the seed. So there's, there's, there's an argument for seed here. So if you, if you, I bet if you did that, if you use the, uh, the repeatable function on that seed that might store it so that it remembers it. Um, but let's go ahead and run this and see how it looks. Um, so here, here are our inputs. You can change, you know, the app, these inputs. You know, a lot of these look like a rug I bought at IKEA College. Um, so, you know, pretty cool app, just making these images. Um, and it, you know, again, it updates this URL here. And again, you can change that as well. Um, so, mm. oh, did I not, ah, I thought I did this. This is a good, good point. Okay. So I, I forgot to turn this into, into a function, right? So function request and then open close brackets. I was wondering why that, that, that uh, bar wasn't showing up. Ah, see, and it even warns you. I missed this warning. Um, so this UI code has to be a function, right? So I'll see if that works. What am I missing here? Maybe Any at the ideas? bottom of that session on the server side, the uh, call of the session. Passing the session. I'm, I think I'm calling that right. Uh, yeah. Are you, yeah, the bookmarking is URL. And these. Wait, I just forgot to, oh, I just forgot to add the. The bookmark button. All right, one more time. There we go. Okay. So, oh, right. No, I forgot why. Yeah. So, if you have this running up here, you don't need this bookmark button. That's what it is. Right. So, so since I was updating this URL automatically, I took that out because you can just go up here and copy it from here. Um, so I thought that was redundant. That's why I didn't do that. Okay. Um, so again, like you can change this in the app or, or through here, works the same as an API. Um, change the string to FDM up here and it changes down here. So, you know, if, 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 if you're familiar with Plumber, or APIs in other contexts, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, the other exercise they had for us was having an app that lets you upload a, a CSV file and bookmark that file and then maintain that state server side. And then we can use RDS. You could read, we could read the RDS file with read RDS to look inside those cache files. Um, so let's do that. Um, so here I just pulled down the injuries table from the previous examples in the book. And then I filtered on just age 18 and wrote that back into my directory here. So I have that file available to, uh, available to me. And then here, the UI is a function. Bookmark button is here. We have our server code with the session. Um, and then we have our shiny app. Right. 
So I'll go upload a file. This is my filter data set that I want to upload. I open that. This is what it looks like just as a, as a head. And then I bookmark that. And here we have this string. This is a, it's a hash of the file. So it identifies that for us. And then if we go into uh, bookmark file app, shiny bookmarks. Um, now why is that different? Let's try it again. Sixty five CA, right? Maybe it was putting it in a different directory back up here. Yeah, so I'm a little unclear on where it saves these things. I think it might. Trying to bookmarks. Oh, here it is. It got confused on which directory it was looking at because I had multiple apps stored in the same directory. Um, so here it is. Um, <clears throat> so it stores that CSV file. where I filtered on just age 18 people from that injuries table. So it contains all those and then the RDS file contains the state. Um, so if we uncomment all this, we can look into those files on comment, I'll add more comments. So I'm just gonna pull one of those files. It helps if I load the library. Pull one of those files. Uh, shiny bookmarks. Bookmark, oh, shiny, uh, maybe not. Yeah, this is one of the dangers of running multiple apps out of the same directory so that it'll get confused on where home is. App dash shiny bookmarks. Am I, am I missing something on why this isn't picking it up? <laughs> List all the files in this directory. Now I'm really confused. Speaking what's of state, it was. What's yeah, your working was, directory? What's your working directory? I might have to quit our studio and, and uh, oh, it's mm. it made noise app. So if I just do this, yeah. So it was getting real confused on which directory it was in. All right. So if we just run the files in, missing a comma. There we go. So we have these two files. I'll just pick the first one and read it as RDS. And this is the name of the file that I uploaded. This is the size, the type, and then the path, which is this. Um, so if we do the same thing out of here, list all the files that ended CSV, just choose the first one to read it. Again, it's that same one that, that appeared in there. So it stores the, the uploaded file and then some, the, metadata about the file from the um, <clears throat> this file input function here. And again, that, that's read RDS was the one I used to, to read that serialized file. Um, so this is, you can read and, 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 and save them the same for the same sort of things. Um, it's pretty useful for saving objects that don't naturally fit as flat files.
So I think that's the chapter. Um, anything that anyone else picked up on? Connor, that was amazing. Uh, my mind is reeling. Um, API calls in general. Um, I wanted to ask a question to the team, but I don't want to deter from the last five minutes of anybody else asking an important question. Has anyone used it on a secure app where you have to log in? Would it still work, do you think? I think, I think you could still mm. use the parameters in there, but so I'd love to do it, but I was trying to think how that would work in a secure where an app where you have to log in. Yeah, I don't know how, I've never done a secure app with, the, with that authentication. So I don't know how that would work. I assume oh, it would uh, just do the authentication and then accept the, the strings. Yeah. I was thinking OAuth oh, is the first thought that I had. So. Um, actually, I, I have one more thought. Um, the first thing that came to mind is I developed a app last year that would take inputs about characteristics of a house in Pittsburgh, and it would try to create an estimated sales uh, estimated sale price for it. Um, and it has twenty inputs, I think. And you know, I never really thought of how to share that with someone because it just seems like a lot of, lot of work to do. Um, and here, I'll, here it is, I'll share it real quick. Um, but you know, if I could just add a bookmark button up here to capture all these inputs, that would be, you know, that's pretty amazing. That's probably the first thing I'll do next time I touch this app. Um, you know, you, you can select a, a school district, it'll create a histogram of, those house types in that school district um, with these inputs. And it's a pretty basic uh, bagged tree model. Um, and it you know, creates a single estimate of the house price there and it, it, it'll change on all those things. Um, but you know, if, if I had a bookmark that would capture all these, that would be you know, up here, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's really that's a really cool application. That'd be kind of cool to see how bookmarking can be used for that. So, um, thanks for sharing that. Um, I guess, uh, well, like we said, we're we're getting up close up to the seven o'clock, so I don't want to um, hold anybody back who has to jump off or anything. Um, but let's kind of look forward here. Um, next week we'll be doing tidy evaluation. Uh, I'm more than happy to cover that one because that's a subject that. I've struggled with in the past and I really kind of want to dive deep into. So, but if somebody else is really, really interested in that topic and wants to take it on, let me know. We could, you know, we could even definitely uh, take it on as, um, as a group if we wanted to. So if you're really, really interested, just let me know. But uh, I, I could take it on because I'm interested in this topic and I really want to get it solved. So, cause I don't totally fully understand it just yet. But, uh, you know, thanks again to Connor for taking the speaking responsibilities. Um, and then, you know, I can hang out here for a little bit if people want to kind of talk a little bit more. But um, <clears throat> we're kind of at our seven o'clock. So if somebody has to jump off, more than welcome to do that. If not, everybody else have a good rest of your night. I'm going to cut off. Thanks, guys. It's good to see everybody. Later. See you, see you Ryan. Ryan, Connor, was there a the, question that you had? It was, it was. And uh, this is probably most one of the dumbest naive questions in relation to uh, uh, dealing with API calls or dealing with any sort of JSON data sort of concepts. I haven't figured out whenever you read curl, C-U-R-L, what the heck are they talking about and where do you put that content? So like if you, if you create your own API call, just to, to explain where I'm going with this subject, our current business is using Elasticsearch on the AWS cloud. 
And we have this unbelievably, oh my God, large terabytes of data that's being stored right now. They say that if you can create your own curl call and then paste that into the URL, bam, um, automatically goes. But I don't even know what the word curl stands for. What, what is the C in, in, in C-U-R-L, curl? Because that, that has something to do with plumber, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So curl is a... Is a um... It's a web utility or a Unix. It's not even a yeah. Unix utility. It's it's a Unix Linux. You know, it's on yeah. on all those Xs. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm not entirely familiar. There's a good example up on the our plumber site. I'll share in the okay, chat. Sure. Here. All right. Um, but this is the gist of it. So you're just attaching that that string a equals four and b equals yep. three. You put that on the it puts that on the end of the URL, and that forms the the API call, as far as I know. But do you run that in your command line, or uh, uh, it, yes, you can. Yes. Okay. And I know this is so stupid and I apologize for even asking such a naive question because at this point in my career, I should know how to do this. When I started looking at API calls and, and everything was pointing at curl, I'm like, okay, but where do you put that? Where, where, where does it exist? Like, how do you actually use this utility? And so I, I, I went into the browser Chrome and started to try and use its command uh, uh, window. That didn't work. That's not an option to go after. Um, Never used Plumber before, have tried to do my own web scraping and sort of successfully done it. But curl as a service is so integrated into Unix commands. And I always watched these command line ninjas just typing away crazy, you know, and all this this media is flowing on their computer. And I'm like, how, what the heck are they doing? Like, how do they do that? I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I, I, I only wanted to extend that since this bookmarking thing was really cool with API, uh, as soon as I saw the question mark and then all of your different variables, I'm like, aha, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now this starts to make sense. But Yeah, I'm also, this is, you know, I spent maybe like a day or two trying to, to hook up a plumber API and, and you know, yeah. got it working, you know, in a very vague sense. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, curl is a utility that you can use in, in the command line and that generates those HTTP requests. Gotcha. Is I was it, thinking maybe, I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ryan. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I was I was only thinking in my mind, I'm like, am I supposed to be using Emacs or am I supposed to be doing buy on this? Like, wait, am I missing something in the Unix command line, Linux command line? Like, why why does this seem so difficult for me to comprehend? But um, I'll give that a shot. I'll, I'll look at this, this page or this package uh, a little closer. Is it... Um... Isn't hitter a wrapper around like the hitter package? Is that a wrapper around curl? HTTR? Yeah. yeah. That's like a that's an R package that it like wraps around the curl commands, correct? Yeah, yeah. Or it's very it similar. Now, you can also do like OAuth and stuff through it. So yeah, it's gotta be and I mean if you look at any uh, dependency tree of R, R packages. Mm -hmm. Anything, anything that hits the internet has has curl as a dependency. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's the backbone of, of all that stuff. Or, yeah. or not the backbone, but a you know a dependency. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, because well, of the same. Oh, oh, go ahead, Ryan. No, I was only going to state what Connor just mentioned or reiterate. So he made a statement about OAuth when Kevin asked the question about authenticating servers in your URL. The first thing that comes to mind is OAuth. And so if you're dealing with any APIs, you can create a secure key, right? Public secure key that would be recognized as your credential to that server. And that would be how you pass your credentials through. Nobody else would be able to use it because it wouldn't hash properly. But if your computer, your Mac address or whatever OAuth does in, in hashing, you don't want to send SSH keys. Don't do that. But right? OAuth keys uh, would be able to, to exchange. Well, that's what I was wondering too, is like, like, wouldn't you like, if you had an application that was behind like an OAuth kind of setup, 
you know, could you have like a bear key or like something that gets like sent in like the front end of the request to like pass those parameters in after you get that, go through that kind of OAuth flow? That was what I thought. Again, I'm not a developer, but that was my thought when somebody asked that question. So. Yeah, so if you look at the, yeah, so there is a curl package for R, which just wraps like the, 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 those base uh, functions from that utility. And then HTTR is a more user-friendly wrapper for that sort of thing. So HTTR handles, like it, it handles the, the, the post and get that sort of thing for you, or, or at least it presents those in more easy to use functions. Whereas curl is just it, I think it just says it sends it over to the, over to the command line. Hmm. I could be entirely wrong. That's my understanding. No, I think you're right. It's it's more variable based, and then it stitches everything together, concatenates everything together. If you're trying to build your own curl command with all of these different API calls, things are gonna break. You're gonna miss miss some characters or or some of the uh, the nuance with it. Um, hmm. I like the the statement you were making about. Uh, potential security and or uh, accessing uh, values that are outside the parameters uh, or that uh, the validate uh, statement. I thought that was a, uh, a really awesome uh, add-on. Yeah, I couldn't think of, of a way to do like a, like a, um, what's the, what's the SQL? Uh, not, not SQL escape, but uh, like if you put escape characters in there, Oh, like said or, or regex? Or, yeah, Rocking. and then maybe you could execute commands on the server side that, that you yes. know, weren't, that Normally weren't available. Uh, intended. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can definitely uh, really start screwing your server up if, you, if you're passing it garbage and not, not preventing that from happening. Well, yeah. but, but if, it, if, if, your no. ser if your app is internet facing and someone can pass, if, if you don't, if you don't escape or just sanitize your your string inputs, yes. someone could just say drop tables. Right. Yes. And, and then all of a sudden, there's the ball game. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's so many ways to pwn servers, uh, uh, especially when when developers or 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 sysadmins are not protecting some of those features, uh, and then once the internet of things finds out about it, it you're done. <laughs> it's, yeah. The whole thing is gonna start coming down around you. Yeah, I think I was looking for the word SQL injection is the one. SQL injection. Hmm. Yeah, so you've got a, you know, I, I'm, I don't plan on doing, on exposing a, a SQL server on the internet anytime soon, because that just, it's a load of trouble. <laughs> there was an amazing video where the, the person was talking about using you know, SQL commands inside your URL. And if you're not protecting that user rights, it's just gonna read it like anything else. And yeah, sure enough, you have completely compromised your database and potentially anybody's passwords and sensitive information that are stored in there. Yeah, really, really, really not cool. But. All right, well, I think that's that's all I had. That was, yeah. I couldn't have hoped for an easier chapter probably. Yeah, I, pa I passed it on and then I started reading and I was like, dang, this is a short chapter. <laughs> but if you're more, if you're more than happy, if you want to take other chapters, like, you know, please do like, you know, um, any chapters that you want to take on, um, definitely let me know because, you know, uh, having people in multiple perspectives is great for this because we can get other forms of expertise and other viewpoints and it really helps understanding. So. Yeah, yeah, for me, unfortunately, I've got some some um, intermittent scheduling things that just change like week to week. So it's hard mm -hmm. to tell if I'll be able to join live or not. Yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Um, but just keep that just keep that in mind because uh, I do appreciate your viewpoint and I do appreciate you taking on the responsibilities tonight. So, well, I'm going to jump off, guys. Uh, have a good rest of your night. Cool. Um, I'll talk to you, everybody in the Slack, and then um, we'll see you guys later. All right, thanks, Colin. See, ya. see you, man. Thanks, guys. See ya.